Hi, it's Jeff here with Permaculture of the Absurd. Today I'm going to be talking about the seven layers of a native forest in Central Texas. I've been spending my time out on our 13 acres in Central Texas trying to observe the native plants throughout the seasons, doing research at home to find inspirations on what steps to take in creating a food forest for our future off-grid homestead. In my research, I read a lot about the seven layers of the forest. I've spent my time studying the land and attempting to identify the layers that are already thriving out here. First up, we have the canopy layer. Here we have the cedar elm tree. It's a native tree that grows around most of the state of Texas, and when mature, it can reach a height of 75 feet. It's extremely drought tolerant, and its sprawling branches provide a ton of shade during our long summer months. It provides habitat for a lot of native birds and insects as well. There are other trees out here, hackberries, dogwoods, and cedars, but this tree caught my attention the first time out here, peeking up over the understory, and I've been visiting it regularly ever since. Cedar elms, they fruit or bloom, produce seeds in the fall, and this one, uh, this one tree, as I walk the perimeter of its branches, it has dozens of young sprouts popping up all around. Here's a young cedar elm. Uh, you can see that its bark produces little wings, and at first I thought this was a disease, but it turns out to be completely natural, and it's going to fade away as the tree matures. I really like this feature as it helps me easily identify the young trees from the other shrubs and plants that grow out here. And here is a cluster of mature cedar elm trees that grew rather close and I wanted to share this because it's a great example of passive cooling. When they're allowed to mature like this nice and close, uh, the branches can trap the warmer air up in the canopy and the cooler shaded air drops down to the ground and it can cool the area by like 10 or 15 degrees, even in the middle of a hot summer day. Uh, so now this is my main goal moving forward, uh, to help all these young cedar elms grow up into a nice, dense, mature forest. And next up is the understory layer. And here we have the infamous mesquite tree. A lot of local farmers are going to curse these trees as a burden, and they are extremely difficult to remove. And as you can see, they can quickly take over a pasture. When you chop down a single sprout, it's going to pop back up with multiple trunks. And they're near impossible to get rid of as they are drought hardy and develop a taproot that can go down 50 feet, pulling up moisture and nutrients to the surface. There are indigenous tribes that noted how the grass under a mesquite is the last green grass during a drought. And I found that the Pima Indians regarded it as the tree of life. The mesquite is a nitrogen fixing legume plant and I hear a lot of gardeners are looking for nitrogen fixing plants for their soil. And lucky for us in Texas, this hardy tree is one. When mature, they can grow up to 30 feet high. The wood is extremely hard and because of its twisting branches, I've mostly seen it used in furniture making. Uh, the wood also produces a smoke that is great to cook over. Uh, the leaves, bark, and roots have all been used for medicinal purposes. Here you can see the bean pods growing. Uh, they will turn brown in the late summer and then they can be picked, dried, and ground down into a nutritional flour that is both high in protein and fiber. So I'm hoping to try to make some later this year. I learned this fact back in like September and it was too late to harvest the pods, so I'm really hoping to get a chance at it come August. And that leads us to the shrub layer. Here we have the pencil chola cactus or the jumping cactus. I don't, I don't know. I guess it depends on who you talk to. Um, but they can grow six to eight feet high when supported by other plants like the mesquite. Uh, they have a very shallow root system that needs well-draining soil. It's an evergreen. Uh, it's drought and frost hardy. These things are thriving out here. It produces red fruits all year long, and it's one of the few fruiting plants in January. When you bump into it, the nodes pop off and sprout new plants where they land. Uh, so when a mesquite branch falls, it launches dozens of new cactus plants that grow and they get even more thick. The fruits, although edible, are extremely labor intensive and they, there's no guarantee of getting rid of all the small, small spines. So it's only recommended as an emergency food. Uh, it's pretty easy to cut though. The new branches are soft and green. Older branches will harden with a bark. Um, but I found that it's a lot easier to cut and remove them in the winter when everything else dies back. Uh, and I have a separate video that I'll upload showing a couple strategies I've used to remove and control the cactus. 
since this is the primary shrub and I'm removing them, I, I will want to come in and replace them with other native shrubs with similar qualities like rosemary, germander, goji berries, chili pekin, and blackberries. Next is the herbaceous layer, and growing in these clusters, I found um, Texas thistle, dandelions, and purple nightshade are the most prominent. Uh, you know, keeping with the theme of pokey plants with spines, uh, they grow wherever they could fit, but the biggest ones tend to grow along the outside edge of these cactus tree clumps. Um, all that I have looked into so far seem to come with some sort of edible or medicinal quality. In the ravines and the creek beds, I have a lot of uh, cockle burrs. Uh, there have been a lot of native wildflowers that seem to be out here um, blooming throughout the different seasons. A lot of pollinators producing flowers that attract butterflies and other insects. Uh, honestly, there's a lot of biodiversity out here already, and I hope that I can just continue to add to it. And now we can talk about the ground cover layer. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of hay and grasses out here from when this was a field for cattle. Um, but I've also found um, some pigeon berries lying around, which, although they aren't good for me, the birds really seem to like them. Uh, and I also found spots of frog fruit um, randomly about. I, I think that's what it's called, and other types of clovers. Uh, all in all, the soil out here is mostly covered and well protected. And for the vine layer, I got really excited last summer when the be these beautiful bright orange fruits propped up on some vines, and I was like, look at all of this fruit, and it turns out they are balsam gourds. Apparently, they were in abundance because literally nothing eats them. They have so little flavor and nutritional value, they just get left alone. Uh, I've seen English ivy growing on some more shady spots on some mature trees. Uh, I've seen uh, on the large pencil cactus that was completely overgrown with uh, what is called a balloon vine. They produce these puffy little pouches on them. And I've also run across a couple of buffalo gourd vines growing across the ground. Uh, so hopefully getting some new native vines growing out here shouldn't be too hard. And maybe I can find one that helps with the cactus. And lastly, I believe we have the fungus layer. Um, I don't see a lot of mushrooms out here. Um, here are some I saw walking um, this past winter growing out of the dead trunk of a mesquite. Uh, and I've seen them popping up around other dead stumps as well. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, and they can be tricky to ID. And uh, very few mushrooms have edible properties, so I don't spend too much time investigating them. I just leave them be, and uh, I like knowing that they're out here. So, uh, the fungus layer. So out here, I believe I have all seven layers of a native forest for Central Texas. Um, panning around and taking a look at all the plant layers working together, Hopefully I can start a transition of replacing some of the layers with native plants that I find more beneficial for me while also increasing the biodiversity of our future food forest. Thanks for watching Permaculture of the Absurd. See you next time.